in this lecture we would answer the question that everyone has when they're first talking about the mysteries of time, namely, why am I always late? This is not a question to which I can give a specific answer. It has more to do with your circumstances than with any scientific principles. But what we can do is talk about how human beings perceive the passage of time, how we in our brains and in our bodies measure time as it passes. We already talked about in earlier lectures the idea of using a clock to measure time. A clock is something that does the same thing over and over again in a repetitive and predictable way compared to other clocks. The reason why we human beings feel the passage of time is because our bodies have clocks in them. We have things that happen in a rhythm over and over again. You have your heartbeat, your breathing, the pulses in your central nervous system. Biological clocks are not very reliable compared to a good mechanical or electronic clock. That's because our bodies are affected by many things that are outside our control. Whether we are tired or exhausted, whether we have adrenaline rushing through our system, also our mental state. Are we focused on something or are we distracted by the world around us? Finally, the way that we get memories and keep them affects how we perceive the passage of time. So we do feel time passing. In many ways, it's pretty accurate, but there's always something that makes us not completely perfect compared to, let's say, a good atomic clock. To set the stage for this discussion, let's just talk about biological rhythms more generally. In any organism, there are things that happen over and over again. That's what a rhythm is, something that repeats itself over and over. The heartbeat is probably the single most fundamental rhythm that an uh, advanced living organism has. We can compare how these rhythms work in different kinds of animals. And just to keep everything else as constant as possible, we can compare how mammals have different rhythms inside their bodies. One way of thinking about an advanced organism like a mammal is it's a network. You have the brain and you have all the different things coming out of the brain, the nervous system, your circulatory system, and so forth. And you can actually make predictions on the basis of network theory for how the rhythms cascade through your body and then compare those predictions to data. So Jeffrey West at the Santa Fe Institute, who studies complexity, he was a physicist at first, but he went into complexity studies as that field came to life and became more exciting, has asked the question about how the networks in different mammals are affected by their size. You find two of the most basic relationships or that if you're a smaller animal, your networks move faster. In particular, your heart beats faster the smaller you are. The less weight you have, the faster your heartbeat is. On the other hand, he found that smaller animals also live shorter lives. The lifespan, the typical lifespan of a tiny little shrew is much shorter than that of a giant elephant or a blue whale. So if you think about this, a smaller animal has faster heartbeats and also doesn't live as long. A longer, larger animal has a slower heartbeat and lives longer. You, you might wonder, do these effects cancel out? And the answer is yes. As a very rough rule of thumb, every mammalian species on average has the same number of heartbeats in its lifespan. That number turns out to be one and a half billion. Roughly speaking, every mammal gets one and a half billion heartbeats in its life. Now, don't take this too seriously. When I tell this to people, they sometimes worry that this is a strict rule, that no matter what you do, it's almost like predicting the future, you will live for one and a half billion heartbeats. And they wonder, should I exercise more? Should I exercise less to get more or less heartbeats? That's not how it works. It's an average, of course, many animals live a little bit shorter, a little bit longer, but it's an interesting feature of our biology that somehow a shrew and an elephant have similar blueprints, just taking reality in different forms, in a really tiny form for the shrew and in a bigger one for the elephant. This kind of scaling law goes far beyond organisms. It goes all the way down to the cellular level. West and his collaborators were able to use this kind of scaling relationship to make predictions for the rate at which individual cells behave in certain ways if they're in an organism or outside an organism. They made predictions which hadn't yet been tested. After they made a prediction, they were tested. The idea that a human being is a complex network of smaller functions talking to each other is a very good fit to how real animals live. Of course, unlike 
shrews and elephants and blue whales, we human beings have another variable, which is the culture in which we find ourselves, the environment around us, the human environment in which we're embedded. And we all know that different cultures approach time differently. The psychologist Robert Levine, who studies how human beings interact with time, is based in Fresno, California, but he sometimes spends time in other countries giving lectures and so forth. He tells a wonderful story of his first semester in Brazil. When he was going to give a lecture, it was scheduled to go from 10 a.m. to noon. It was a regular class he was teaching. He's walking down the street and he asks someone what time it was, and they said it was 9.05. He didn't have a watch himself. He says, oh, I have plenty of time to get to my lecture at 10 o'clock. About half an hour passes, and he asks someone else what time it is, and they say it's 20 minutes after 10. He panics, he rushes to the lecture room, and there's almost no students there yet. He says, what, what is going on? So he asks the students what time it is. One says it's 9.45, they're looking at their watches. One says it's 9.55, one says it's five minutes past 10. What Levine realized was that no one's clock in Brazil reads the same time, and nobody cares. The students sort of came in very, very gradually to the 10 a.m. class. By 11 a.m., the room had more or less filled up. But it wasn't that the students were lazy or didn't want to go to the lecture. When noon came along, he said that in California, when the end of the lecture was scheduled, you would know. Every single student would be rustling in their chair, looking at the clock, ready to go. In Brazil, none of the students moved. Who cares? It was 12 o'clock at the end of the lecture. They were still interested. They had questions. They kept discussing. It became 12.30. Eventually, he had to escape. The point is that different cultures approach time differently. Levine also spent time in Japan, and he says, of course, compared to what you would do in California, the Japanese found that his natural timekeeping was incredibly lax and kept telling him to hurry up. In Brazil, they kept telling him to calm down. It's not these anecdotes that are really important. What's important is data. Can we actually do a scientific experiment to justify these stories about how different cultures perceive time? And the answer is yes. A bunch of different studies have been done to basically try to measure the pace of life in different cities, different cultures, different environments. For example, you can take how long it goes if you walk up to a post office and you want to order some stamps. Psychologists have sent people to order stamps in different post offices in different cities throughout the world and found consistent differences in how long it takes to get those stamps to get to you. There's also a study where you can just measure how fast people are walking. You sit there in the cafe, you walk, watch people walk by, you measure how fast they're moving, and once again you find systematic differences in different cultures and in different cities. For example, you will not be surprised to learn that in higher population areas, people walk faster. People literally will walk faster down the streets of New York City than they will down the streets of a small town in Massachusetts. It's not because everyone else is walking faster, it's just because that's what the environment does to you. Another obvious effect is technology and industrialization. Psychologist Richard Weissman has compared the pace of life in cities over time. So he does this walking experiment. He sees how fast people are walking down the street, but rather than comparing one city to another one, he compares one city 20 years ago to the same city today. What he found was that over the last 20 years, the pace of life has increased by 10%. That doesn't sound like a lot, 10%, but it's only in 20 years. How quickly will it go over the next century? Wiseman also found that the effects are different from place to place. Singapore was up 30%. Guangzhou, a city in China, was up 20%. The areas of the world that are developing and industrializing and gaining high technology the most quickly also see their pace of life increasing the most quickly. Nevertheless, your stereotypical guesses aren't always right. It turns out that New York City is far and away not the fastest walking city in the world. In fact, it's behind cities like Dublin and Madrid and Copenhagen. There are many complex features that go into how quickly life is lived in different environments. Technology and density are very important, but we are very far away from having a complete theory of how this works. Another place where we're very far away from having a complete theory is how individual people perceive the passage of time. There's one lesson that we have certainly learned, which is that the human brain is not a computer program. 
We think about the human brain as very similar to computers because the human brain clearly computes in some sense. We can mimic some things the brain do in a computer program, but the way the brain came together is very different than the way you would write a computer program. The brain developed over literally billions of years of evolution of life here on Earth by an incremental change through random possibilities being tested and seeing what works. A computer program, on the other hand, is usually written from the start. You have a task in mind, and you're going to design it from the top down in the most efficient way you can. Therefore, in a computer program, if you want to store data, for example, well, you have an array that you can put the data in, and that's that. In the brain, any task that you might want to do is probably shared among many different pieces because that's what was useful at the time. In particular, when it comes to keeping time to measuring duration, there are different parts of the brain that kick in. It's a highly distributed feature. It's not like a simple clock that you have in your computer. There's some chip that has a rate that you can buy a faster and faster chip. The brain has many, many pieces, each one of which contributes to our understanding of time. As one experiment to demonstrate this that is very vivid, neurologists did an experiment with rats. And we should keep in mind is that neurologists, neuroscientists, hate rats. They're constantly torturing these poor little rats. So the rats have a brain much like we do. They're mammals, you know, as, as far as all of life is concerned. Rats are pretty close biologically to human beings. They have a complex brain. They have a cerebral cortex, which we, we have also. It's the gray matter in our brain. The cerebral cortex is the outside part of our brain. It's where we do our higher information processing. The life of consciousness is happening within our cerebral cortex. There's also other organs inside the cerebral cortex, which are more primitive. We think of them as giving us subconscious brain functions. So you can actually take a rat and remove its cerebral cortex remove sort of the advanced parts of its brain, but the rat will still be alive. It won't be able to do mazes and other things that we teach rats to do. But what the neurologists, neuroscientists have found is that rats can still tell time even with their cerebral cortex removed. They give them a little task like pushing on a lever. If they push on the lever once every 40 seconds, they get a food reward. The rats without a cerebral cortex can measure the time interval of 40 seconds. That means that whatever we're doing, when we're measuring duration and time, it's not a, a matter of our conscious brain. There are unconscious things going on. And there's more than one thing going on. Another experiment with mice was able to show that mice, with their whole brains intact, could keep track of at least three different rhythms. These mice had three different paddles that they would push to get food. And to get the food, one paddle needed to be pushed once every 10 seconds. Once had to be pushed once every 3, 30 seconds, and once had to be pushed once every 90 seconds. The mice were able to separately keep track of the time intervals necessary to get the rhythms right in all three paddles simultaneously. And you might think, well, 30 seconds is 3 times 10, and 90 seconds is 3 times 30, so you just press this one three times and this one once, etc but you could actually turn on and off the rhythms. You could displace the rhythms so that the 10 second one was out of phase with the 30 second one and the 90 second one. The mice could still keep track. So inside our brains is more than one timekeeping device. In fact, you can sort of roughly divide it up into different kinds of timekeeping. As you are listening to this lecture right now, there is a part of your brain that is keeping track of what time of day it is. This is your circadian rhythm that tells you when you wake up, when you go to sleep. There's another part of your brain that is keeping track of how much time has passed since the lecture started or since you started listening to it. And there are yet other parts of your brain that are more or less like alarm clocks. They keep the amount of time before some relevant future event. If you want to go to dinner or go to bed or something is going to happen, how much time do you have before that happens? Your brain is keeping track of that. Now, this is a complex set of operations. We don't have a grand unified theory of everything. This is why brain science and biology is much more complex than physics is. But Neuroscientists have been able to isolate at least three different kinds of time perception, three different ways in which we increase or decrease the rate at which time seems to pass for us. The three ways are, number one, pulses, sort of the, the basic way that you would keep track of time in a clock or with a pendulum going back and forth. There are pulses in our brains and we simply count them. 
Another thing that affects the passage of time is our sensory input and focus. What are we paying attention to? And finally, and sort of most intriguingly, the way in which we accumulate memories affects our notion of how much time has passed. The more memories we accumulate, the more time we attribute to what happened. So let's consider these three aspects in order. When we say counting pulses, it makes you think that there is a little part of your brain that is almost like a pendulum going back and forth. And that is not true, or at least we don't know of any single part of the brain that acts exactly like a clock, like a chip in your computer. Rather, there are multiple levels of pulses. The different neurons in your brain do work by a pulses. It's not that the neuron is constantly sending signals. It's that there's a signal or there's not a signal. So neurons turn on and off. There's multiple levels of pulses due to all the neurons in our brain, and together they help us perceive the passage of time. Again, you will not be surprised to learn that we can affect how quickly those pulses go. For example, we can affect them through drugs. Stimulants make our pulses beat faster. If you drink caffeine, the pulses in your brain that keep track of time go a little bit faster. Depressants will slow them down. If you have alcohol or other depressants, even something like marijuana, the pulses decrease in their rate, and it takes us longer to accumulate a certain perceived amount of time. Now, whenever we talk about this kind of phenomenon, we have to be very, very careful because people say, well, you drink caffeine and time speeds up. But in fact, as we talked about way back when in the early lectures, time is always moving at one second per second. When you want to say that time speeds up, what you mean is that one clock has sped up compared to some other clock. When you drink caffeine, your clock speeds up. But what that means is that when you compare it to the world, the world has slowed down. So your clock has sped up compared to the outside world. We have to be sure to get that right when we're talking about effects on our internal clocks. These effects from stimulants or depressants, we think, are effects on the neurotransmitters that send signals from our neurons to other cells in our brain. Neurotransmitters like dopamine and other chemicals are what the neurons send, and they do it in the form of pulses. Caffeine or alcohol or other drugs can make it easier or harder for these neurotransmitters to be sent that speeds up or slows down our internal clocks. But that's usually not what makes you late. If you want to know why you're always late, it might not have anything to do with caffeine or booze or anything like that. It's probably due to the second aspect, which is the sensory input and focus. When you are focused on a task, when, when you have you know, a, a really hot first date, or when you're in re a really engrossing project for work or at home that you're really in love with, you don't pay as much attention to the outside world. And in some sense, which psychologists still don't understand, you also don't pay as much attention to your internal clocks. So your effective internal timekeeping device slows down. The outside world speeds up. If you're having a really interesting date or conversation with someone, you think that a half an hour has passed, but in fact it's been like two hours. Your focus on one task makes it harder for you to tell time. Usually, if you're late, it's because you've been focusing on something else. Contrary-wise, if you're bored, if you're on a plane ride and there's nothing going on, if you have a tedious aspect to your job, your attention is constantly flitting around. You are not focused on any one thing, and the opposite effect happens. Your internal clock seems to go faster, the outside world slows down. It seems to take forever to get that plane ride across the country simply because you're bored and your attention keeps wandering. The final aspect is the rate at which we form new memories. So this is a fascinating thing that, that neuroscientists are just beginning to understand. You might have, as an example, uh, this idea that if you're in a high-stress situation, time seems to slow down, by which we mean your clock speeds up, the rest of the world seems to slow down. This was uh, noticed by a neuroscientist named David Eagleman long before he was a working neuroscientist. When he was a child, he once fell out of a tree. And it was long enough that, he, it was not so long that he was really hurt, long enough that he was very scared as he was falling out of the tree. And he remembered, as he grew up and became a working neuroscientist, that the world seemed to slow down. If you've ever been in an accident or a very, very stressful, sudden situation, everything around you seems to move more slowly. 
So Eagleman wanted to know, is it really true that in these high stress situations, your internal clock beats faster, therefore making the rest of the world seem to slow down? The problem with this question, as a working scientist, is that to answer it, you need to scare people. And that's not really good procedure when it comes to human subjects. But what Eagleman did was to figure out a way to scare people in a way that wasn't really dangerous. He threw them off of a tall building. But he threw them off of a tall building onto a trampoline, so it was actually perfectly safe. And while they were falling off the building, the theory was they would get scared, there'd be adrenaline going through them, even though they knew there was a trampoline down there. They, they weren't surprised by the trampoline. And he had them actually do little recognition tests. He gave them little pieces of equipment that would flash numbers on a screen. And it flashed them either fast or slow. If they were so fast, they would be flat flashing so fast that you couldn't recognize the numbers. If they were going slow, then you had the time to see what the numbers were. And what Eagleman did was to compare how good you were at recognizing the numbers when your adrenaline was running and you were falling out of the building versus when you were just sitting at a desk calmly. The answer is there was no difference. Despite the fact that there was adrenaline going and your pulses were racing, you were not any better at recognizing the quick flashing numbers than you would have been sitting calmly at your desk. So therefore, in that sense, the speeding up clock inside didn't help you perceive the outside world. Nevertheless, if you talked to the subjects afterward, they said that the outside world slowed down. They had a perception that time had slowed down for them in recollection after the effect. So there's a theory about what is going on. The, quest, the, the theory is, and it's just a theory, it's not something that we can test very accurately, that the more memories you accumulate, the more time seems to have passed. When you're in a high-stressed, scary situation, your brain does its best to record absolutely everything that has happened. It's scared. It's looking around. It's accumulating a huge amount of data. Even though it's not perceiving things any more quickly than it would otherwise, when you think about that event afterward, you have more memories, you have more data to leaf through. And therefore, it seems to us like more time has passed. This hypothesis is, gets a little bit of support from a related fact, which again, everyone knows, even if you haven't been in a scary situation, you know that time seems to pass more quickly as we age. When you're older, the summer seems to rush by. When you were a kid, the summer seemed to last forever. This is not just an anecdote. This is not just uh, uh, an idea that people have. This is something that you can test. The theory that Eagleman has and other people have is simply that when you're young, in the summertime, you're going to the beach and whatever, it's all new to you. Everything around you is a new experience. When you're older, you've been there before. It's a little bit more blasé. So it seems to pass more quickly for you compared to what it did when you were a child. And this is something that, again, we can try to test. The way that neuroscientists have tried to test it is to give 20-year-olds a test where they're simply told, starting now, tell me after three minutes had passed. And then they give the same test to 60-year-olds. And the answer is that 20-year-olds are pretty good at measuring about how long three minutes are. So they have no clocks around them. They're just sitting there quietly in an empty room. And they say three minutes have passed. And on average, the actual amount of time that has passed is about three minutes and three seconds. Very, very accurate. But you do exactly the same test to 60-year-old people. And when they say three minutes have passed, the actual elapsed time is more like three minutes and 20 or 40 seconds. So... 20-year-olds are better at estimating time than 60-year-olds. For an older person, it takes longer for the same amount of subjective time to pass. The theory is that that's because they don't create as many new memories, but the fact is that it does take longer. There's even a hypothesis that tries to make it quantitative that says the amount of time we experience grows logarithmically with our age. It would be very hard to put exact data about that, but it makes sense to us. Think back to that boring plane ride. If you're on a boring plane ride, it seems to last forever. But if you recall it after the fact, it seems to go by very quickly. You might remember that you were bored, but you don't have some elaborate memory of every single event because none of the events were interesting. You're, you were not focusing, so your subjective time at the time seemed to last forever, but you were also not making new memories, so your subjective time after the fact seems to make the trip actually quite short. 
Another aspect uh, that is very interesting when it comes to how human beings perceive time is a simple statement that we live in the past. So forgetting about measuring time using our internal clocks, what about when we actually just perceive the moment now? We all think, whether we're presentists or eternalists, that there is a moment called now. We are perceiving it, we're looking around, we're getting data, sense data from outside of ourselves, and we experience what we call the present moment. It turns out, of course, and if you thought about it a little bit, it would make sense, that what we call the present moment isn't the present moment. That's because it takes time, number one, for the information to get to us, and number two, for our brain to process that information. The most obvious example of this is if you see lightning very, very far away, you see it, and we all know that if lightning is far away, it takes time for the sound to get to us. You can even count how many seconds it takes and figure out how far away the lightning storm is. That's because sound moves more slowly than light. But it's not just the external world that matters, it's the internal world that matters as well. So for example, you, you can do this at home, I won't demonstrate, but you can touch your nose and you can also touch your toes. Do it at the same time. Put your finger to your nose and to your toes. And what you will notice is that you feel the touch simultaneously. If you perform the touch simultaneously, you will feel the touch simultaneously. That seems very natural to us. But it shouldn't be natural because the amount of time it takes the nerve signal to travel from our nose to our brain is much less than the amount of time it takes the nerve signal to travel from our feet to our brain. Now, the nerves are moving pretty quickly but we, as our, our brains, are very, very good at measuring tiny differences in time. More than good enough to be able to measure the difference between the signal coming from our feet and the signal coming from our face. Nevertheless, we don't perceive that difference. We perceive the simultaneous touches as simultaneous events. Why is that? It's because our brain knows that our feet are further away and takes that into consideration. It turns out that what we consider to be the correct moment right now is actually about 80 milliseconds in the past. The way that you can get that number, one simple way to do it, is to watch a person dribbling a basketball. As they're dribbling the basketball, you both see it and hear it just like the lightning bolt. And your brain corrects for the fact that it takes the sound longer to get to you. So as the person dribbling the basketball moves away, you see and you hear the sound at the same time in your brain until they get so far away that it takes more than 80 milliseconds for the sound to get to you. At that point, suddenly, there's a mismatch between the sound that gets to you and the sight. That's because you get the vision of it and you put together that in the conscious now before the sound can get to you. So we live about 80 milliseconds in the past. And really, the primary lesson to learn from this is that consciousness is kind of a messy thing. It's very difficult to understand what's going on in the brain because it's a very elaborate mechanism. This is why physics is the right thing, right field of study to go into if you have a short attention span. Speaking of which, people have different attitudes toward Time. And this has nothing to do with culture, this is just within any one culture. Individual human beings approach time differently. And it turns out, the psychologists have shown that our orientation toward time is a crucial component of how we live the rest of our lives. There's a great experiment that illustrates this called the Stanford Marshmallow Experiment. Uh, it was first done by Walter Mischel, a professor at Stanford, in 1972, and it's a simple setup. You offer a child a marshmallow. You, you fool the child first. Every psychology experiment involves fooling the subject into thinking that it's an experiment about something else. So you make the kid do something, and then as a reward you say, here is a marshmallow for being a good test subject. But then you say, I have another marshmallow. You first check that the kid likes marshmallows. I can give you a second marshmallow if I need to go out of the room for a few minutes. If you wait and you don't eat that first marshmallow, I will give you a second one when I come back. So roughly speaking, when you do this experiment on three or four year old kids, only about a half or a third of them can actually wait for you to come back. The kids eat the marshmallow, some of them. Others are very, very patient. They use elaborate strategies of self-deception, looking around, trying their best not to look at the marshmallow. The claim of modern psychologists is that the difference between eating the first marshmallow immediately and waiting to get two marshmallows later shows you something about your orientation toward time. There are people who really, in some sense, 
dwell in the past. What they care about most, what they're talking about all the time, are what happened in the past, what happened when they were growing up, high school, college, whatever. There are other people who live in the present. They want something right now, they want that marshmallow, there it is, and they're going to eat it. There are other people who are future-oriented. They know that there is some benefit coming to them in the future. They will sacrifice the marshmallow right in front of them to get that marshmallow in the future. They're future-oriented. This is not a matter of being rational or irrational. Economists will tell you it makes perfect sense to discount something that is a reward that you won't get until the future. If someone offers you $10 now or $11 10 years from now, you should just take the $10 now because our brain says, how do we know that they will be around 10 years from now to give us the $11? That is a perfectly rational thing to do. Nevertheless, the ability to take the future just as seriously as we take the present turns out to be a good predictor through how we approach many things in our lives. The psychologist Philip Zimbardo, also at Stanford, has done a follow-up study on Michel's marshmallow study. He studied now the kids who were three and four years old. They're now in high school and in college. What he found was that children who waited, who got the second marshmallow by being good, scored higher on their SATs, had better behavior in school, and more scholastic achievement. It turns out that our attitude as human beings toward time is a crucial component in making us who we are. <laughs> <laughs>